So our final speaker today is Gary Marcus, the CEO and co-founder of Geometric uh, Intelligence. Uh, he tells me he has uh, uh, accumulated, acquired a reputation for uh, hyping uh, his startups, and he says he's not going to do it, so I'm going to do it for him. Uh, this is one of the most talked about companies in the field, and he's going to try and tell us as much as he can about what he's up to. So I think what I said was I have a reputation for debunking hype and that I don't want to hype my own company. And so when I heard the word breakthrough earlier in the day, I got like little um, bad chills down my spine. Um, um, I don't promise you a breakthrough, but I am glad that you stayed through the day despite the false advertising. But it, I'll tell you something interesting, I hope. Um, so so um, uh, if you read this or if you know me, then you know I'm a college professor um, and that, that's what I've done most of my life. And so you're probably thinking, what's a nice professor like me doing closing uh, a session on startups? So I'm going to try to explain that to you. Um, I had kind of the usual professor upbringing. I went to a small liberal arts college in Ma Western Massachusetts. And then I went across the uh, state of Massachusetts to Cambridge, Massachusetts to the institution that is sponsoring this conference and I got my PhD. And then I got a professorship at NYU where I've been for 20 some years. Um, and I wrote a bunch of books, which is kind of what you're supposed to do if you're a college professor, or maybe not a psychology professor, then you're not supposed to write books. But anyway, I wrote a bunch of books. Um, the Algebraic Mind, of which I think um, is particularly relevant now because it was critiquing the precursors uh, to deep learning, multi-layer perceptrons. So I've been thinking about these things for a very long time from an academic perspective. I wrote another book about the birth of the mind, which is really about the genotype uh, phenotype uh, gap and how we might think about it in cognitive science. Kluge is about uh, why our minds are so crummy despite evolution trying to make them better. Um, then I have a book out recently called The Future of the Brain, which is an edited book about neuroscience. Um, and then I have a book that doesn't fit with any of the others, but people actually read it, so that was the bestseller book, um, Guitar Zero. We can talk about that on another day. But that led to a gig in which I started writing for The New Yorker. And here's something that really strange happened. There was a piece in The New York Times in November of 2012 which said deep learning is going to completely change everything. And I wrote one of my curmudgeonly anti-hype articles for The New Yorker. Um, uh, this isn't the actual title, but it was about deep learning, saying, hold on, you know, deep learning is very cool, but it can't do everything. I'm going to read you an excerpt from it. And what's really crazy, and you'll only be able to see in the front row, is it was the most emailed article in The New Yorker. It was ahead of Adam Gopnik. This kind of bo boggled my mind that anybody would actually care about deep learning. Of course, this was several years ago. Now everybody cares a lot. But I thought that was kind of interesting. And I guess that was a seed for why I decided that maybe I should go into the commercial world. I was coming from the perspective of cognitive science, saying, what does cognitive science have to say about AI? And I suddenly realized people cared about that. And that's part of how I uh, moved over. So here's what I wrote three years ago, and I, I, or over, over three years ago, and I stand pretty much by every word of it. Um, I said, realistically, deep learning is only part of the larger challenge of building intelligent machines. Such techniques lack ways of representing causal relationships are, and are likely to face challenges in acquiring abstract ideas. They have no obvious ways of performing logical inferences, and they're also still a long way from integrating abstract knowledge. And then, um, and Oren used the same metaphor more or less in his talk at the beginning, and I think in many ways my talk is an echo of his opening talk. Um, to paraphrase an old parable, deep learning is a better ladder, but a better ladder doesn't necessarily get you to the moon. Um, not everybody appreciated my, my negativity, I suppose, but um, people took notice of it. So I think that we haven't made quite as much progress as we think we have. I think that AI is not as healthy as people think. Um, in some domains, there really has been exponential progress. These are data on chess where you can actually quantify things pretty carefully, and you can say what the rating is over time, and Ray Kurzweil would probably love this figure. Um, and of course, Google is maybe even a little bit ahead of that curve, um, with, with or DeepMind with, with their Go champion. Um, but what about in strong AI? I would argue that in strong AI, like artificial general intelligence, where you can take any problem, feed it into the system, and get the flexibility of human intelligence, I'd say there we've made no progress. However, there are no data, so all I could do is to make some up, and so I'm doing that for you. Um, here's Eliza <laughs> in 1965, and I have uh, you know, taken the liberty of plotting Siri uh, more or less now, and I would say that that's a shallow linear slope. That Eliza and Siri use the same basic techniques of hunting for templates for particular things, using little tricks to convince you that it's real, even though it's, it's really um, a system that doesn't really understand what's going on. Strong AI, don't think we've made that much progress. Um, uh, and this is what makes me a true entrepreneur, as I can quote from Peter Thiel. 
um, who said we wanted flying cars and instead we got 140 characters. Um, there are some companies actually making flying cars, don't tell Peter, but I think the sentiment is basically right. Um, and my take on it, if I can get the clicker to work, um, is we wanted Rosie the robot and instead so far we've got Roomba. Um, so we, we have a ways yet to go. I'll give you uh, some data on that later. Um, this is actually, um, I think, the most accurate Wired article in the last five years of AI. Most of them are like, deep learning has solved this, deep learning has solved that. Usually if you pull back the curtain, there's a ways to go. Um, this headline suddenly actually spoke the truth, um, which is the best AI still flunks eighth grade science. There is a competition that Oren uh, and AI Squared uh, put on. I should say I'm a, uh, nominally a consultant at AI Squared, so maybe um, disclose that. But um, they, they had a test to, to look at eighth grade science, and, and the best scores were like 60%. And you can get like 50% just by Googling the answers. Um, the hard ones, you know, AI is still not working so well. Um, here's what I think the core problem is, is that we have lots of corpus data for common examples, and we have systems that are really good at high frequency things. And then we have lots of, we have a very long tail in most domains of things where we don't have a lot of corpus examples, and the systems that we have, the techniques that we are using are not really very good as you go out into that long tail. Um, so here's an easy question for today's deep learning systems. What is this man carrying? Probably most of them can say a horse. But a harder question would be, why is this scene unusual? Those of you who have no idea should probably just go now get your coffee. You're probably asleep. Um, to me, anyway, it's pretty unusual. Um, or there are these captioning systems. There was a lot of buzz about these last year. So um, you have a picture like the bottom left, and the captioning system, you know, it's trained on a bunch of images and captions that go with them. There was a really cool database released by uh, Microsoft that led to a whole slew of papers like this. And you get something like a group of young people playing a game of Frisbee, and you're like, wow, we have machines that can actually like read what's going on in a picture. Um, but if you look in the fine print, there's some problems there. So some of the answers are just downright bizarre. Like here is a parking sign with stickers to my eyes, but the system said it's a refrigerator filled with lots of food and drinks. Um, so this is my uh, calling Dr. Oliver Sacks line, um, the program that mistook a street sign for a refrigerator. Um, there was a great paper. Um, some of the people who were working on this paper are now working for me. Um, where they uh, discovered all the ways that you could easily fool a deep network. So for example, that yellow and black stripes, if you feed it into AlexNet, um, it will tell you that you have a school bus. Now, I have people, friends in the deep learning field, if I still have any friends others to this talk, people who were my friends before I gave this talk, um, and they say, well, you know, people are subject to, to optical illusions too, and I say, yes, but these are more like hallucinations. <laughs> um, but I intend to use that to my advantage when the apocalypse comes. Um, I've got a t-shirt made up with this. It says, don't worry, kill a robot. I'm really a starfish. Because this is an actual stimulus from this paper. Um, the, the system thinks that this is a starfish because it has the wavy line. So the system, and there's a serious thing behind that, which is these systems are good at low level perception, but they don't necessarily under, understand integrated holes. And they work because you have, you have closed world. There's only a 1,000 objects in it. But you have a larger world they can get pretty confused. Um, I wrote an article called, I think, Eight or Nine Problems with Big Data with Ernie Davis in the New York Times. It was um, also a most emailed thing um, there. Um, the best part about the article, besides our wonderful stellar writing um, and, and intriguing ideas, is the graphics, which we had nothing to do with. Um, I love this graph. There's actually, it's even better if you go see this on the web, because it's actually an animated GIF with like two or three things like this rotating. But I think you get the idea. Um, big data, it's often correlation, not cause, causation. You have how often one thing happens and how often some other thing happens, and you hope for the best. Um, so I feel like this puts me in the position of being the guy on the right, counseling unpleasant truths, and not everybody um, wants to hear what I say. They would rather the comforting lies that we're about to solve um, your favorite problem, but you know, it is what it is. So what would be a better paradigm here? Well, I don't know for sure, but I know where I would look. I would look to my son. This is when he was about two and a half years old. He's now three and a half. Um, and why would I look to my son? Well, because he's clever, like all kids are clever. Um, so here's what happened um, a year ago or so when I was giving a talk uh, in San Jose. I got th uh, this text from my wife, and, and she says, she asked my son, which of your animal friends will come to school today? And he says, Big Bunny. And then he explains why. He's two and a half years old. He says, Bear and Platypus are eating. So my wife's like, oh, really? And she goes to his room, and she sees this. He's made a diorama, and sure enough, Bear and Platypus are, in fact, eating. So what does this tell us? 
Um, it says, first of all, he understands complex syntax. So in Chomsky in terms, this is what's called a WH question. Which of your animal friends will come to the school day? It's fairly complicated in, in linguistic terms. Um, he's able to do logical reasoning. If bear and platypus are eating, well, then I guess they're not coming to school. That's an inference. He's able to give novel answers depending on recent updates to the state of the world. So he's not just cached a bunch of things in his memory and done a keyword search for what hit for animal friends, right? He knows, he knows about today and why today is different from yesterday. He's got a theory about what you do depending on whether you're busy or not. Pretty impressive stuff. Um, he understands what linguists would call pragmatics, and as I say at the top, he's learned a lot without exabytes of labeled data, right? So, you know, the paradigm is you have a lot of labeled data. He had two and a half years, probably the first year he didn't even know the phonology, so it doesn't even count. He had a year and a half of basically unlabeled data and figured all this stuff out. If we could build an AI system like that, that would be really cool. Um, I've been thinking about how kids learn about language my whole career since I studied with Steven Pinker many years ago. Um, uh, a lot of it has been about how kids learn rules. I have a paper in science in 1999 on, on the topic that's somewhat relevant to what I'm doing now. Um, and so I formed this company, Geometric Intelligence. And what we're trying to do is to mine cognitive psychology and cognitive development for insights into building new techniques for AI uh, and machine learning. The metaphor I like is the drunk circling around for keys, and then when you ask them why are they circling around for keys, and they say, well, because that's where the street lights are. Well, I think we need more street lights in AI. It's perfectly fine to use deep learning. I think it does actually illuminate an important corner of perception, but there's cognition too, and we need other techniques for that. Um, so some of you may have seen there was an article about us in Technology Review. Um, uh, I hope the answer is this is yes. I'll just say parenthetically that um, the Guardian ran a spread about me asking if I could learn to play uh, guitar like Jimi Hendrix, and the answer turned out to be no. We'll hope that this one turns out better. Um, so here's my co-founder, Zubin Garamani, um, one of my co-founders. Uh, he's uh, one of the world's leading experts in machine learning. There was actually a piece in Technology Review recently by, about Orinazioni, semantic scholar. Um, and semantic scholar said that the most influential person in computer science was Michael Jordan, not the one who took jump shots, but the one who's a professor at Berkeley. Um, you should all know his work. The most influential person uh, on Michael Jordan is Zubin Garamani, my co-founder. So um, I'll tell you a little bit piece of trivia. We were born on the same day, February 8, 1970. Um, and when we showed up at MIT as graduate students, neither of us were young, uh, old enough to drink. We were too young to drink. We couldn't go to the Money Charles Bar. So this company is our revenge. <laughs> so um, our goal is to redefine the boundaries of machine learning through innovative patent pending techniques. We have something new. I'm not going to tell you how it works. Um, but the idea is to try to learn more efficiently from less data. We're trying to approximate the power of rules and regularities from the old symbol world, but doing it in a different way in a framework that's less brittle and incorporates modern advances in machine learning, but while still trying to extend beyond them. As I've already said, you know, we're taking inspiration from cognitive psychology. We're funded by people like the founders of Dropbox, Quora, and Yelp that's next door. Um, and what we're focused on is data efficiency, interpolation, and extrapolation. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit of data. We're still early days, but um, we're, we're pretty proud that we've made the progress that we have. So what we're trying to build as our kind of first internal research um, goal is a drop-in replacement for deep learning. So everybody's going around using deep learning, but deep learning is very data hungry. And so what we have is something that you can feed in, something like the MNIST benchmark, for example. You feed in a bunch of um, images, and you have to learn categories. And the red dots show that we're learning it faster, basically, th than uh, deep learning techniques. And I'll, I'll say why that might matter in a second. Um, we have pretty stable results. So those of you who know how to read um, box plots um, will realize that what this is showing you is that we basically were beating deep learning every time out. It's not just a fluke. Um, and we're also able to do this on some real world uh, data now, uh, uh, like the Google Street View database. Um, why would you care? Why would learning it more efficiently um, from data matter? We live in this era of big data, and the notion is we're just going to throw more and more data at every problem, and that's going to solve the problem. But I would say there's a catch. Um, in some domains, there's never enough data. So I, I was a Steve Pinker student, and I went to Noam Chomsky's classes and so forth, um, and stay in touch with him. Um, and what Chomsky always argued is there's an infinite number of possible sentences, and he's surely right about that. It's easy to prove. Um, and yet there's only a finite amount of data. So Chomsky called this the poverty of the stimulus argument. And if you think about it in machine learning terms, semantically annotated data, where you've got like a sentence, maybe you have a, a syntactic parse, even better, and you have a semantic uh, structure, which could be like a database query or something like that on the back. It's really expensive. It takes trained linguists to do it. You can't just um, have your average Amazon Turker do it. So it, it's expensive, and there's really, even today, only limited amounts of, of data that you could train a semantic parser on. So that's one example where if you're more efficient from data, then you've got something. 
Um, in other domains, there might be mission critical data that you need, but they're risky to collect. So it's fine to run your cars in Palo Alto where the you know, weather is usually sunny. I did see rain there the other day, um, amazingly enough. But in general, um, you will not see rain uh, in Palo Alto. And so if you train your car in Palo Alto every day, um, you're not going to see rain. You're not going to see so many taxis. You're not going to see people running around in bicycles or like me. I, I've ridden a unicycle through Times Square uh, at one point in my life. You're not going to get a lot of data on that. So you want to be as efficiently as possible. Um, in other problems, there are regime changes. So if the world were perfectly stable, like the game of Go, you could collect data just endlessly. You could keep simulating it. But if you're talking about financial markets, things change. So you have something, the value goes up and up and up. That's the value of taxi medallions in New York. Historically, it looks like a great investment. And then, boom, Uber comes along, and it's not such a good investment anymore. Well, if you can limit the number of samples you need to do your automated financial analysis, that's a good thing. Um, in other domains, you can get simulated data, but the simulated data aren't really a substitute for real-world data. So you can play an Atari game over and over again, you know, billions of times, or you go, or something like that. If your character dies or you lose the game, so what? But if you had put the same techniques of, say, reinforcement learning in a domestic robot and it knocks over your furniture a thousand times, that's not a good thing. Probably people will send it back to the factory. So you'd really like to be able to learn more efficiently. Here's just a real world example of this point. So um, I don't know if I can get this to play. Maybe help in the back. Um, it's much more fun if it plays. Um, Okay, there we go. So um, the DARPA competition, you probably all saw this blooper reel, but if not, you should see it. So the thing about it is that everything that they did here was done in simulation. Well, it worked all in simulation. And then, you know, so there was practice on stairs and opening doors. This was the kind of Fukushima competition. Um, and, you know, you get to the real world and there's like friction and wind and, <laughs> and you've got problems. So here, here is to sum up. Um, until we dive deeper in the into the mind, in drawing on cognitive psychology, drawing on cognitive development as a model for how things could work, we might be stuck between a kind of rock and a hard place. And the rock is AI systems with limited flexibility. So, um, you know, Siri has a little card to tell you the kinds of things you can ask it about, but there's a broad array of things you can't ask it about. Same thing, you know, Amazon Alexa, which I just uh, got, you know, comes with like a three by five card or a little fold up thing, um, you know, telling you you could ask me these things, but there's a lot more you might want to ask your intelligent assistant eventually. So we have these AI systems with limited flexibility, and at the opposite, um, we have flexible systems that aren't really AI. So I mean, I think Facebook's fairly straightforward about the fact that the M project can answer anything. We heard about that um, today, like, will you plan my wedding? But that doesn't mean that there's actually a machine there um, doing the, the planning the wedding. Um, so come join us. We, we would love to have more help. Uh, we are always hiring jobs at geometric.ai. And you can follow me if you want on Twitter, at Gary Marcus. Thank you very much. Thank you.